I was saying thank you, and I was asking, is this our cue to start? Is that is it just to us now, Ani? I think it is. I think okay. it's just All right. that. But, and since we've known each other for so long, let me say, I would be remiss if I did not say I was not only nominated for the NAACP award, but I won. That's the yes. only, only <laughs> prize that my family has ever heard of. <laughs> so, so that's why I get real excited to tell people because they didn't care anything about my work until I won that that's NAACP so funny. award. That's so funny. Well, congrats again on that. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. So good to to be with somebody that I've known and loved for for so long. Same so. here. It's it's good. It's an honor. I'm just happy that we get to honor you tonight and talk about your work, this brilliant novel. Um, before we get into it, though, I just thought, you know, I know your roots are as a poet. So I want you, I want you to, um, let's hear you read a bit and sort okay. of give us a little incantation okay. to get, get that out in the air so we can get started with, with your words. The novel is called The Love Songs of W.B. Du Bois and it begins with a song. We are the earth, the land, the tongue that speaks and trips on the names of the dead as it dares to tell these stories of a woman's line, her people and her dirt, her trees, her water. We knew this woman before she became a woman. We knew her before she was born. We sang to her in her mother's womb. We sang then and we sing now. We called this woman back through the years to our early place, to our bright shoots rising with the seasons. We know her mingled people. How they started off as sacred hummed verses. And now we go back through the centuries to the beginning of her line to a village called the place in the middle of the tall trees. And we start with the boy, the child who will change everything on our land. Wait. We know you have questions such as, if we tell the story of a mother's line, why would we begin with a boy? And to your wonder, we counter, we could have begun with a bird's call or with a stalk of corn, with a cone from a tree or a tendril of green. All these things lead back to this woman's line, whether we mention them or not. Yet since our story does not follow a straight path, we travel to places here and across the water. We must keep to the guidance of time. To the one who first walked past a tall grass covered mound in a particular place in the woods. And we have questions as well, for despite our authority, we cannot know everything. And so we ask if a child cannot remember his mother's face, does he still taste her milk? Does he remember the waters inside her? Can you answer those questions? No, and neither can we. Yet we remind you that many children commence within women. And thus, this is why it is completely fine that we begin with a boy. And so we proceed. Sing that song, honey. <laughs> you know, what, and gas me up. <laughs> <laughs> it's my job tonight. So, <laughs> so you know, when I first entered the book, particularly like at that moment, I remember reading it and thinking, "Oh yeah, yeah, she's still a poet." You know, and the thing is, um, you know, I was thinking about uh, our friend Mitchell S. Jackson, who says you know, all writers need to be poets, mm, you mm, know? Mm. And and reading this book, it's so clear, like this is such a great model for that. And and seeing, it's like a, a you know, 800 and some page prose poem, you know, uh, going through it. And I'm just wondering when you think about the relationship between your your poetry and and writing, you know, prose, whether it's, you know, writing essays or short stories or the novel. Um, what is that relationship? How, how does the poetry inform your prose writing? 
Well, I think that um, when Mitch uh, talks about, um, and we both know Mitch, we're both friends with Mitch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mitch talks about uh, all writers should be poets. I, now, I don't want to appropriate what, what he meant, but I'm wondering, I'm mm -hmm. speculating that what he might have meant is that you pay attention to sound. Mm -hmm. You pay attention to sound, you pay attention to economy, you don't waste words. Um, there is a meter that uh, you, you, you get into. I mean, I remember though, when I was going through the copy editing process, um, which is different from, of course, my, my main editor, um, mm -hmm. Aaron Wicks, and the copy editors would come in and say, do you want to change this? So there's no, there's no rhyme. And I'd say, no. <laughs> because I think that for um, us, uh, 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 particularly Black poets, we come from a, uh, uh, a shamanistic yes. tradition, okay? And so we know that you, you uh, conjure with poetry. And for me, maybe it was cheating, but I said, well, you know, this is my first uh, book and it's 800 pages long. I'm gonna have mm -hmm. to work medicine up in here to get somebody <laughs> to keep going through 800 pages, right? Yeah. And so there's a feeling that that um, I get when I write poetry. It's it's a song in my flesh, um, mm -hmm. it's like prayer. And there were moments, um, particularly when I was writing the songs, but also when I was writing the, the, the two uh, sections that were in a close third of, of Ailey's mother and then Ailey's sister, there was a feeling and I could even feel my body moving a particular way. That's not the case with Ailey. Ailey mm -hmm. is a very, um, you know, straightforward first person. I, I did work very much on the language, but I have to be honest, um, there wasn't that same kind of joy with mm. Ailey that I had, but I think that I was okay with that. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can't eat chocolate cake every morning for bread. You know <laughs> what I mean? So there's a point where where you really have to calm down from the ecstasy and begin mm -hmm. to think about the plot, to begin to think about craft. And so those were the moments that I could pull back when I was in the Ailey moments and look at the different portions that were very ecstatic, the songs were the most ecstatic. Mm. They came to me in dreams. And then I began to try to impose historical research, um, you know, craft, you know, uh, uh, character development, plot yeah. um, and all of that. But Ailey was the, was the portion that I had to work for. Um, mm, mm, interesting. She, she was the leader, right? Yeah, this, I mean, she's our she's our protagonist. So she's yeah. our protagonist. She's our heroine. She is the heroine of this black woman's, you know, kitchen table epic. Uh, you know, I invented. You know, you know, you teach. You gotta come up with stuff. <laughs> so when people were like, well, "What do you call?" and I was like, "Um, I think this is a kitchen table epic." And then I had to try to figure out what that meant. But she's our Odysseus. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 She's our Odysseus. And so I needed to be able to say, where is Ailey going? And also, how does her story mirror the American story writ large? Mm -hmm. And so that is, but I had a lot of fun with her, you know, because she's you know, she'll cuss people out and <laughs> she get she gets people told, she says exactly what's on her mind, you know, and, and so I thought, you know, that would be for my folks who don't like serious literary, you know, I, I wanted mm -hmm. to pull, to suck people in of, of different, you know, places. I knew that literary, people who enjoyed a literary novel 
would yeah. maybe dig this, but I wanted regular black folks. Okay. All right. Regular black people mm -hmm. to pull them in. And I'm yeah. seeing a lot of that, which makes me feel really good on like social media where they're like, I ain't never read a book this long. I love this book. Yeah, no, like I told no. you about that sister on Goodreads who said, yeah. Donna Ray put her foot all up in there. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. oh my God, yes, right? So that's what I wanted. I wanted regular black people to really dig the book and to see, and then, you know, as a teacher, pull them in, mm -hmm. teach them some things. You know, that's what I wanted. Well, you you got something in there for everybody. I mean, it is it is um, you know, it's a page turner. And I've told people, I can't think of the last time I read a book of this size. You know, I think I was in college, to be honest with you. You know, and um, I was in college. <laughs> you know, and you know, uh, and that was it's been a minute. <laughs> you know, so you know, mm -hmm. and for me, I'm I'm also a slow reader because. I'm not just reading for, you know, the pleasure of like taking it to the beach. I'm also looking at the craft, you know, and it was hard. It was hard to like, like, you know, read it and not get caught up into the, cause your scene building is so like beautifully you know, done. Let me, let me tell you something. And so, you know, as I tell people, we've known each other for a long time and you will just say, um yeah this wasn't your best or you <laughs> remain silent right so when i got this text from you you were like this is good and i was like oh okay okay you know because i yeah. was very nervous for you to read it because I yeah know, yeah you do not give praise easily and you uh -huh. tend to be you you do you don't i mean but so <laughs> but that's the thing when you, when, you know, I used to hang out with Jews back in the day, right? And they just <laughs> keep it real. So when you get this, this real praise from you, yeah, then you're yeah. like, oh, okay. You know, oh, okay. And it's the same thing. You know, a lot of brothers, you know, do not like fiction. They only like nonfiction. Mm. And so, oh yeah. I mean, that's the big, that's the joke on uh, bookstagram, you know, uh, Instagram okay. that, you okay. know, they're like black, black, black guys do not read. They like a lot of history. They like a lot of nonfiction. And so these, these hmm. books are like, and not, yeah. you know, I hadn't thought about that. You know, I'm a, I'm a dude. And I hadn't really thought about that because, um, you know, like so many of my friends are, are writers. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, we talk about, you know, whether we're, you know, I'm talking to poets or I'm talking to fiction writers, we, we often will talk about novels, you know, yeah. but, but you also know, as you mentioned earlier, before we came on camera, I am a noob and, and my frat brothers, you know, um, they're, you know, they're always recommending nonfiction books. That's it. My, my brothers are, my biological brothers are, are hairdressers. And they read a lot of nonfiction as well. And mm -hmm. they're always recommending that to me, mm -hmm. you know, so I hadn't really thought about it like that, but yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's accurate. And so for me, it was important that black men see themselves. It's a woman's book. We know this and you know me, I am a radical feminist. Mm -hmm. It's a woman's book. It's a black feminist book. And I say that in the back, um, you know, of the book. I'm uh, yeah, and we have that one chapter. What's is it like feminism, womanism, or whatever? Right, that, right, that right, right, right. That conversation <laughs> cracks me up. That I conversation mean... <laughs> is a conversation we've seen and we've heard seen so many times. Oh, you know? many times. But <laughs> but one of the things because this was a community, and I was very. In, you know, I was really intentional about that. I wanted somebody in the chat says, yay, a feminist. Oh, oh, <laughs> for real, since I've been a toddler, okay? But I wanted Black men to see a range. You do. I was going to, I was just about to say, like, it's not like this isn't, you know, for for the for the men out there. This is not a a, a, a man bashing book. No, I mean I there are people, some 
I you mean, know, there's moments, but I mean, it's, brothers in there, but there's a lot of good brothers. So really good, Uncle Rue. You know, everybody yeah. loves Zulu Uncle Rue. Harris. You know, I was oh like, my it's God, a, Zulu. <laughs> it's I like, love some, Zulu. Some good love, brothers in there. Some good brothers some good in there. Brothers, everybody's got their flaws. Yeah. But then you have people who lean more toward the good, mm -hmm. and then other people who lean more toward the bad. I wanted that entire community. It's real. Be shown. I, yeah, I it's wanted. real and it's full. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. You know, another thing that I, I love about the book is that, um, well, there's so many things, but I, I'm gonna, I just want to start a, talking a bit about the relationship between the elders, okay, and the youngins in here, okay. and the way in which, you know, because you you mentioned since we already, you know, um, evoked Uncle Rude and harris and you know all these all these elders um you know when i when i think about it it's uh it's a book that also celebrates you know generations and so you know when i looked at the structure of the book this is like the thing that's one of the one of the real i know you like to get into those weeds with with uh craft yeah no i mean it's like it's like one of the things that's so amazing because you know like i i look at a book like this like whenever we um you know when we're in the classroom we're talking about books we try to break down you know theme and structure and put that up on the board and talk about like you know so you can actually see like just how rich it is right mm -hmm. and um and now, uh, is there a hand raised? Is that yes, there is a hand raised. Oh, it went away. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. okay. Uh, oh no. Okay. All right. Sorry. All right. No worries. No worries. Okay. You know. And so, um, you know, you see that, and you think, okay, um, like, how is this thing put together? Like, what's happening here, right? And you know, like, you know, like, when you think about this, like, I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, what I'm loving about this book is that it's doing all these things that I know most people wouldn't have uh, the courage to do, you know, just in terms of like writing a, a novel today, okay. right? So you have the I'm historical, you have the make... historical, they have the historical okay. and the actual, okay. and you have the fictional, like you created, you know, this town. Cause I, when I first, I hadn't read the back matter when I first mm -hmm. got into the book. So I was like halfway through and I was like, where's Chickasetta? I don't even know. You you know heard. what? There are like several people who are like, I looked this town. I tried to find Chickasetta. I tried, I looked it up. I was like, what is it? You know, and then I went to the back matter and I saw, I said, oh, okay. She's doing a right. fuck It's on Eatonton, me, you know? but I don't, but I didn't, you know, I was a little girl in Eatonton. Yeah. So yeah. I know parts of Eatonton, but it's the same thing where people keep saying, at least from Washington, D.C., okay? Mm. And I'm like, um, no, it's an unnamed city yeah. because I knew that you, you know, you spent time in DC. Yeah. Kenny Carroll is in DC. Yeah. <laughs> uh, DJ Renegade is in DC. Yeah. And you know, DJ and Kenny, they just don't, they, they don't pull no punches. So I was <laughs> like, if I get DC wrong, they coming for me. So that's why I just <laughs> said the city, but it's clear the Mecca is yeah you know, yeah, a yeah. I, was, I was that was so funny because i was like okay right. this is howard you know it's like, gotta like, be howard right <laughs> yeah, but yeah. but i but i don't know i don't know howard you know my late sister um uh, uh cc um cc graduated from howard law mm, and okay. yeah CC graduated from howard law moot court law review and right. um and she's a graduate of spelman college Nice. And so I know more about Spelman, even though I didn't attend Spelman, because I went uh, for two years at Clark College before I transferred, four years actually, because I was a really bad student. I went when I was 16, <laughs> I was supposed to graduate when I was 20, and then I didn't graduate you know, college for two more years. But so I know a lot about Spelman, and also my mother's a Spelmanite. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And, you know, Cece and Val, my oldest sister, are Spelmanites. So I know a lot about Spelman, even though I didn't attend Spelman, but Howard is not. So I want it, but I also, you know, you don't want to get sued. You also don't want people thinking, Olukeme ile sami, se HB 
he used for the win. That's right. I heard that. I'm a Howard. Yeah. I'm a Howard alum. So he's yeah. a Howard alum, <laughs> right? And um, and my father taught at Howard, mm -hmm. um, with Toni Morrison, when the great Sterling A. Brown mm. was mm. still alive. Wow. And um, oh yeah, I, I always tell the story about my mother said there was an event because my father helped to um um found that uh, uh, literary magazine back in the early 60s. Mm. Okay? You know wow. what you're talking about, right? Yeah. So him, Toni Morrison, some other people. And, yeah. um, and so my mother talks about they had a, a gathering, right? A literary mm -hmm. gathering. And she said, um, this white man showed up with his white <laughs> I'm talking about brown. <laughs> right. So she, you know, my mama is a as as um, oh, my late man. friend James can say, a brilliant rock on tour. Okay. <laughs> and so my mother said, child, this white man showed up. And everybody was like, who is this white man? Who is this white man? She said, and then he 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 said he was gonna read some poetry. And I was just real confused. And then strong she, men. She you said know? he got up to the podium. And she said, and then this white man started reading, and Georgia just crawled out of his throat. Right, there wasn't much more to people because she just get hold of us some kind of way, you know. And so my mother was like, "It was amazing, right?" So she has all these stories, right? And so what That's I awesome. wanted That's to awesome. do, what I wanted to do is to have also spaces that are all black, mm -hmm. that non-black people are like flies on the wall. What we say when there are no white people in the room, what we mm -hmm. talk about. Um, and I think I think that, um, you know, although, uh, what do you call, um, uh, uh, when, when people start doing publicity for a novel or whatever. And so people, you know, they want, they said, okay, you know, double consciousness. But my, but my, but the book isn't truly about double consciousness because, Double consciousness, as Dr. Du Bois talks about, is that Black people are always aware of the white gaze. But mm. what I wanted people to understand is that Black people don't always think about white people. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't think about white people all the time. The only time I think about white people is when I have to leave my house um, or when, you know, I'm trying to make some money. <laughs> right you know I gotta you know negotiate my check right or something like that um although I do have very close white friends but my close white friends are all woke and so mm -hmm. I don't have to it's hard um, to be friends with them if they're not woke you can't you can't be friends <laughs> with white people if they're not woke the only thing the only um kind of thing that I do that is aware of race is that I don't use the N word around them. I'm old, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I have a very close Asian friend. You know, he's a man of color. He's a, a clinical mm -hmm. psychologist. And I use the N word all the time in front of him. <laughs> he's yeah. like, I'm like, you, you, you Asian, you, you, I know you done heard this word before, right? But with my white friends, that's the only thing, but they're incredibly woke. And they, and they, you know, so I wanted, I wanted people to be able who aren't, I wanted black people to see themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and to be like, yeah, this is how. Yeah. We yeah. And you've got the spectrum. You've got the spectrum in there. I, I mean, it's like, it's like, I have I mean, booty. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody black know a booty. Oh, Everybody man. black know yeah. With somebody named Buki or Bucci or Pookie or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah, you know? yeah. Right. I have Buki and then I have Uncle Root. Uncle Root. I have a whole range, you mm -hmm. know, of education, of, you know, all of that. And, of um, you know, and Buki is, is, is a wild young man. And then he, be, you know, and then he joins mm -hmm. the church. Yeah. I remember there was a brother I used to smoke weed with back in, <laughs> back in college, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think he might have sold weed, right? He might have grown weed. And we, I mean, we would, we would, 
Um, and it's so funny now, I have no tolerance for alcohol these days. But we would be mm. drinking wine and smoking whatever. Next thing you know, he was preaching. I ran in him and he was like, well, I found the Lord. <laughs> yeah. And you will see that in black communities, right? The, yeah. like the, the wildest brother would be yeah. like, I'm a deacon now. Okay. Mm. I'm married. That's right. That's right. You know, and I wanted yeah. people to sort of see that. That's so when Buki says, you know, he started going to church, you know, and, and so that's the thing. And then, and, and, and you sort of see that. And I see it even in myself. I'm, I've always been sort of deeply spiritual, but as I've gotten older, I am leaning into my old black you know, um, church lady, although I am old black church lady, pro LGBTQ, you know, radical yeah. feminist, yeah. that sort of, I joke, yeah. about that sort of like, um, an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'm an evolved black church lady. Yeah. Yeah. We, we're, we're both, you know, we've known each other for a long time. So, we, you know, we both are religious, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a praying man, but yes, I know, you know, but I, you know, the church, you know, it's problematic. You know, the so, church is so. very incredibly problematic. And one yeah. of the things, like, um, you know, that I'm telling people because it, it's not like I feel like I have to have permission, but I, I want people to know that um, this this is the last time I'll write an 800 page epic. But this is <laughs> not the last novel. And yeah. people were I like, "Where's Coco?" And I said, mm, I didn't yeah. want to, Coco has her, a place, mm -hmm. but I, I, this is my first novel and I was really, really nervous about depicting Afro indi indigeneity. Okay. Mm. That was something I was very, until mm. um, one, uh, uh, two of my Native American colleagues one of them texted me and she was basically like, girl, you did this. Oh, okay. Like, Thank yeah. God. You know, yeah. because I do identify. Well, that's, you know, okay. So I gotta, I gotta jump in yeah, here. Go ahead, jump on in. Jump so, on. so one of the things I wanted to say earlier about the, the, the mix of the historical accuracy and the, the fictionalized world is that, you know, the historical accuracy justifies the fictionalized world. So the things that we see in the fictionalized world, we believe that, yeah, this, this is how this would operate or can happen because we now have the context of all this historical accuracy in the book. That, it's so clear, you know, and then you, you also give the root of every cause in the book. Like you start, like we have, you know, Pinscher, we have all of that background. And then we can get into, we can just let the, the characters do their thing because now we're informed by actual history. And that's the thing. Well, you know, that was very, you know, not that I'm comparing myself to Toni Morrison. I always say mm -hmm. Toni Morrison was a genius and the world needs to know. And Somebody you know, just put a question about Toni Morrison. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get so, back yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Van knows that I had to grow to appreciate Toni Morrison. I wasn't, I didn't always like Toni Morrison's work. I think that it that it takes a a real depth um, that I wasn't you know it took me ten times starting beloved and then the tenth time I could finish it right mm -hmm. but Toni Morrison would always say that whenever she started a novel there was a question that she wanted mm -hmm. to answer okay you know sometimes when I'm feeling low I watch Toni Morrison um interviews and she mm -hmm. always soothes me right mm -hmm. and so my question was how did we get to this place yeah. how did we get to this place as a country as a region um as a culture right because we don't have race is not a static thing but when the when the when the novel begins it 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 morphs. It's almost like an, a character of its own. Okay. And then how do we get here as a family? So all of these sort of things. And so you have to know, you got to start from the very beginning. You can't start in the middle. 
to try to figure out. And that's why the book is 800 pages long because I wanted, I wanted, but, but there was also something that I felt was very important. Um, you know, it took me 11 years to nine years to write the book and then two more, two and a half with my editor at Harper. The country changed then, as you know. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, Jet Magazine come to life. You know, when I started this, you know, Obama and, you know, President Obama looking great with his beautiful wife, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, the little Michelle's grandma, Michelle, they were always, you know, impeccably groomed, all of that. And so we all thought, I mean, and I'm pretty radical, but even I, I was like, oh, okay, you know, this whole thing has changed. So I'm writing about the past, past, okay? Mm -hmm. Then 2016 came along and this whole thing just, and I thought, Oh my God, you know, I'm actually writing about, and this is not humble brag, it was like weird. I was like, I'm actually writing about stuff that is coming to pass, yeah. right? And then yeah. January the 6th happened, you know, right before they started sending out arcs. And I was like, this is bizarre. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so then it, it became, so, you know, February, March, it became clear to me that I could not do this with my novel. I could not say, oh, I just wrote the novel. I had to then do what I do with my students, with my, the, the, the kids, right? The college students. I had to begin to sort of talk through you know, what, what is going on? I couldn't just simply say, well, I wrote a family book and da, 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 da. I had to really be very clear because, you know, then we're old school and we come from the tradition. Yeah. We don't just write for us. We write to try to lead this world that's a right. better place. Right. That's and right. that's, that's what I had to just embrace. But you know, you you know, you're like, well, I, you know, even at 54, I'm like, I'm too young for that, right? <laughs> I'm too young for that. But I'm, but I'm like, you know, I I decided that that was something that I that I had to embrace. So yeah, yeah. we're getting to some questions. Are we going to get into some questions? Well, I, well, this is gonna be five minutes. I wanted to ask you a bit about um, the spirituality in the book, you know, because okay. we've talked about the elders. And we talked about them um, guiding these young people in this book, yes. um, but you know, um, you know, spirituality is there uh, in Christianity, and you know, um, you know, shamanism, you know, in other ways, yeah. you know, and so um, you know, characters who are sort of there to guide um, Ailey and these and the daughters in general, and then um, also, um, you know, some of them are there you know, an afterlife as well, yeah. you know. So um, can you just like speak to that a bit? Like, you know, that decision to kind of, you know, start with this, um, you know, like very early, like history of the land and then kind of going to the afterlife in the book. Well, the issue of spirituality kind of connects to the question of the elders. Mm -hmm. um, again, you and I are of a particular generation where we had gray-headed folks mm -hmm. who would pull our coats and who would nudge us along, who would stand in the gap, you know, who would write us letters of recommendation, who would give us mm -hmm. advice. Yeah. That. What I have found is that social media has become the great equalizer, okay? And so I get a lot of young folk who are sort of, you know, coming at me like, hey, girlfriend or whatever. And nobody likes to be lectured. So I don't lecture them, mm -hmm. but I'm like, I would, and I'm coming to a point about the spirituality, I would be remiss if I tried to act like I was girlfriends with the with these young folk okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they gonna need me okay you you, you know I, we're looking at history now we're not let's just looking at this time they need someone 
who don't want to kick it with them at the club. Okay. Yeah. We yeah. all folks, we drink brown liquor at the grown and sex. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We don't need to be kicking it with you. Okay. When y'all are doing whatever, these little TikTok dances and all of that. I'm like, set yourself down. <laughs> okay. So, so for me, the spirituality was a guide for me from for example, Miss Lucille, mm-hmm. who, who was mm-hmm. my mentor and second mother, mm-hmm. my mother, okay, mm-hmm. um, Dr. Trelly Lee James Jeffers, um, and 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 they would always say, you know, you you're gonna need someone to. My mother would say, you're gonna need someone to lean on. Miss Lucille was a visioning woman, okay, and so when I met her, I met her in a very needful time when I needed a lot of care, okay? And also when I was feeling very strange about the fact that I was having visions, Hmm. having spiritual visions. When I came out here, Van, um, among Native- To Oklahoma, okay, yeah, yeah. To Oklahoma, Mm -hmm. what happened was that Um, even though at that time I wasn't accepted as part of the community, now I'm, you know, I have a little bit more of a connection, right? What I learned is that what I viewed as strange uh, uh, in terms of my vision was perfectly normal. And so I noticed that in non-Western context, you didn't find that in the black community as well? I found that in working class black communities. Okay. But as yeah. I, yeah. you know, and you know, I, I have Academia. straddled, yeah. I have straddled yeah. both. My father was black bourgeoisie. My mm-hmm. mother was working class. Mm-hmm. So my grandma was like, you know, I, I mean, I remember, um, this is naughty, the night I lost my virginity, the next morning, my mother came up to me and she was like, is there something you want to say to me? Mm. And I was like, no, ma'am. And then my mm. sister Cece said, mom had a dream. Mom had a dream, right. My mother, my mother is a visioning woman. Mm. Um, she has prophetic dreams. So, but because my mother was of the working class, but upwardly mobile, mm-hmm. Right, I remember my daddy used to call her witch, right? But <laughs> when I would move into these educated black communities, now what we have is educated black women who are joining the Yoruba religion, right? Uh, yeah. That is yeah. something very recent, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But out here, you would have, out here you have uh, highly educated Native Americans that have gone to Harvard, whatever, and they are very much about non-Western, you know, visions, you know, etc. And so I wanted to bring that into the book. We're at 745. So that that's that's you know, mm-hmm. that's what that's what I had. And I think it's very important. I am interested in people who what they see of African spirituality. There are two characters that I'm always <laughs> curious about. You and I will talk off, you know, yeah. whatever, right, about yeah. that. So questions. Uh, so the first question we got was, I was going to read the whole thing because I, 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 love, I love where it begins. I love this book, exclamation point, all right? I am in the middle of reading it 300 pages or so in, and I read it, I, I read it every night before bed. My question, the characters are so vivid. Which characters were the most challenging to write? Samuel Pinchard. Mm. Bar none. Mm. Samuel Pinchard is a monster. Yeah. Okay. He is a monster. He has no mitigating characteristics. Yeah. Um, my editor, Aaron Wicks at Harford, Aaron Wicks is a genius in the world needs to know, mm. insisted that I write the background for Samuel Pinchard. Mm. Those 15 pages took me four or five wow. months. Mm. I mm. 
had nightmares. I, I mean, mm. <clears throat> you have to, you have to go into some really horrible places. Yeah. Right? He is something else. Yeah. He is something else, but he is also shored up by mm -hmm. the, 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 the intellectual production of his time. And um, yeah, I mean, the 19th century, the 18th century, you mm -hmm. know, it's like, you know, these, you know, black people are, are, are related to the great apes and, um, <laughs> and black women don't feel the same about their children. So it's totally fine in the 19th century. If you sell little children away from them, like what they did was they created a whole, you know, science. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he was, he was the hardest to write. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second question, uh, Toni Morrison talked about the importance of her writing being oral. Uh, how much were you influenced by her in your attempt to create writing that sounds beautiful? She has sounds and uh, quotes. Yes, uh, I think you succeeded and you're the first writer who reminds me so much of her in that way. Go ahead, Ani. I love the sound of your writing. Um. Well, I love Toni Morrison. I mean, I have mm -hmm. read... Um, uh, beloved seven times okay i have said that i will never date a man again who has not read um uh, <laughs> beloved. that's just that's, all your brothers are listening right i just i'm just it's just it's all you, you've got to have read beloved because to read beloved is to know so much about me okay um but i'm influenced by her but and I hope this doesn't sound arrogant. Um, I don't need Toni Morrison sounds. I have my own sounds. And yeah. what I need Toni Morrison for is a path through um, craft. She teaches me so much about craft. Mm -hmm. She teaches me so much about America. Mm -hmm. She teaches me so much about the artist's way. She was an yeah. editor. She was mm -hmm. uh, Lucille Clifton's editor, Gail Jones's editor, and yeah. Davis's editor. Um, but what I will say is this: there was a, a, a I, I saw a a, um, a a conversation years ago between the great uh, scholar uh, Mark Anthony Neal mm. and Liz Wright. I love Liz Wright. Wow! And he and Liz Wright were talking, and she said something about people were always comparing her to Cassandra Wilson, okay? And, oh, and man. she said, I love Cassandra, I will never forget this because yeah. I, I use this. I love Cassandra Wilson. She said, but our instruments are so different. Mm -hmm. I okay. love that. I love that. And that's the thing. Toni Morrison is a mother of, the, you can't get past Toni Morrison if you are Black, male, any, any gender, mm -hmm. any gender, the full range of gender, okay? Uh, uh, um, heterosexual, homosexual, asexual, mm -hmm. aromantic, mm -hmm. you can't get past Toni Morrison, but our yeah. instruments are very different. Um, and so, uh, and also she was a genius and I was blessed to be on this earth at the same time that mm -hmm. she was. And so while it's so wonderful for people to compare me to her, it makes me deeply uncomfortable because, mm -hmm. you know, she's, she's a giant, yeah. you know? But, but, it, but, it, but, but I mean, sure, I'm just drinking that up like cream, you know, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's still, mm -hmm. it's like, this is my first novel. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here's the third one. Okay. From um, Nyla. Nyla. Yeah. I would love to know how you're able to bring white writers into the black experience. I know you mentioned that this book is for everyone. So how do you make it for everyone while also staying true to the black experience? It's a great question. That is a great question. What I would like to say, um, Miss Nyla, because I, I I sense a bit of politics in there, and so <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, keep it 100, as the kids say. Um, oh wait a minute! I want to say there's a, there's a response here I, to to Nyla. It says I am a right a white writer, white reader. 
reading this book felt like a curtain was lifted for me on aspects of black African-American life. I wanted to read this because I, I know we talked about this a bit before yeah, yeah, we yeah, came yeah, on yeah. camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, African-American life and culture that I had kind of sort of glimpsed, intuited, and now I got to see it with sharper spectacles, still awesome mysteries, but comforting and special. That's, that's beautiful. What I, that's, what, beautiful. that's beautiful. I, I, I think Nihilist's question is incredibly brilliant because, you. you know, um, we're always wondering, you know, how do you keep it real, okay, as a Black writer? Um, but, you know, frankly, you know, want everybody to read your book. The first thing I'll say, Sister Nyla, is um, these are always questions that, and, 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 and I'm putting this in a way, please know this ain't no shade. I'm actually mm. answering it mm. so that you can you can feel me. Okay? I know what you're going to say. You know what I'm about to say. <laughs> Nobody ever asked a white writer, right. you know, I notice everybody in your book is white. Do you ever worry that Black people won't feel connected to your book, right? Mm -hmm. it, this, is, this takes us back to Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison gave me the courage to say what I just said. There you go. Okay. The, Van and I came up in the game in a very different time. We had to be careful as we were writing and we always had to find ways to do, see the kids nowadays, they ain't having it, right? You know, but this is a different time, okay? Ironically, the horror that we have seen over the past four to five years freed young black people. Mm. Okay, but we were not free in the 90s. All right. Many of us had never been in all black workshops until I know I had <laughs> until we went to Cave Camp. That's right. That's right. Okay? CC. We were, we were, that was it. That was the it. Bras were it trying to everything. Cry them, right. Cry them <laughs> thug tears. Right. They were like, I'm good, I'm good, right, you know, and, 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 you know, we sisters. 96. 96, oh, gee, okay, and so, <laughs> so we were, you know, we were terrified, and we would, we would, we would, and then as we got more successful, we were like, okay, now I can be a little bit whatever, now I can mm -hmm. be a little bit whatever, right, but young folks don't know what's going on, but Toni Morrison stood on that rock of, of, of moral righteousness all by herself and was like, I write for me, I write for my people. And that's what gave me the courage, yeah. all right? So yes, our instruments are very different, but she has been, she has mothered me without my even have met her to tell me that I have a right to write this kind of work. But I also, this pandemic, I call it pan, I call it the pandemic YOLO. You know how, to, how Drake said, you only live once? Mm. <laughs> if not now, when? If I can't be yeah. myself now, yeah. when I could go outside and have one of these folks that don't want to wear masks breathe on me and then next thing you know I'm gone if the Lord call me if not now when yeah. and that's I I just you know this yeah. is it. so we got uh two more I just want to say real quick the the, the I'm going to go to the last one for a second just because it's related it just as a statement, I too am a white writer and I so love reading black literature, love the voices, the lives, and just learning about my black friends. Thank you. And thank you for the black with the big B. Amen. Okay? That's how we doing it right now. That's, that's okay? right. That's doing, right. They used to do that back in the 60s. And then we got down to the little B. We all did the little B. <laughs> Up until 2019, I was doing the little B, and now it's the big B, and it will forever be the big B. That's right, Nyla. There you go. It will always be the big B. That's right, okay. Um, and Justine, uh, yes. this conversation is so insightful, and I'm most appreciative. I'm also so happy to hear you. One of my favorite authors, 
mention another uh, favorite author besides Toni Morrison, Gail Jones, who is so undersung. Can you say more about her influence, if any, on your work? So I, I just have to hold up your book first before I go to this, but I, I have to say, I'm an, if you can get that in there with my yeah. blurred background, but also the new- uh, Oh Palmeiras. yeah, I got that joint. You yeah, know, I got yeah. that. I, I haven't cracked this, yeah. I haven't cracked this yet. I've been I've been in this so so I haven't gotten to this yet. So and look at you with the little tabs in the book. Oh my I, god! Hey, I had to get ready for you, Yanni. I mean, I can't come <laughs> in here unprepped. <laughs> you know, but um, a white rat. Oh, uh, those stories. Those stories, man. Like nobody Ooh, talks so about good. those stories. That's nobody so talks about those stories. Those stories so extra good. Okay, mm. they are real good. And yeah. the way that she used the language, I think when you go back to black women writers of the 70s and the 80s. There's an unvarnished aspect to their language and the way that they approach the vernacular that I think is very clearly predating MFA programs. Yeah, yeah. And so what so, I- I mean, sweet yeah. fly paper of, of life, those stories are. I mean, like, so you know, like you, mm. Go ahead, they're, go ahead. They're just, they're just real. They're it's real. Like, it's like chicken ceasing to the bone. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. when you get down to the bone, you just want to be chewing on the bone even after <laughs> all the meat bone. You're like, oh, this, is, this chicken's so good, right? Yeah, yeah. It's very, it's very. And I think that for me, um, I'm very blessed to have gone to an MFA program. I have my bona fide days, right? I have, um, you know, this is how I'm full professor. I'm the first black full professor in the history of my English hey, department. There you go. Right? There's all of that. And I got the craft and I got, you know, uh, uh, all of that. But um, half of what, thank you, uh, 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 Kindred. Um, but what I, realize now is that what you see in love songs is my unlearning a lot of those you know like um one one of my favorite songs is um by parliament funkadelic you know ready or not here we come <laughs> right and it said something about out of my con constrictions out of my right? constrictions out of my constrictions <laughs> and that's what i i stripped off that so if you yeah. there's one point in particular when you get to bail section and we're um talking about jw Mr. J.W. and Miss Jolene. And there's this one part where they're talking about how J.W. got outside kids. And it says something like, the people in the church said, J.W. wasn't the first person to have an outside woman, but the problem was he didn't have no shame with it. Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to write that yeah. even 10 years ago. There was a, there was a freedom. Mm -hmm. that I had. And so when you're seeing this, this, this blackness, this free blackness, mm -hmm. I had to strip my fear away. And I learned that from Toni Morrison and I learned it from, um, from Lucille Clifton as well. Yeah. Yeah. And she's also a poet as well. Go yes. Ahead. She always yeah. tried to, she always got cranky when people <laughs> would say her writing was poetic but I don't think we can ever say, you know, like mm. that, that section in Beloved where she talks about the corn, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, and the juice yeah. in the corn yeah. and all of yeah. that. And she just keeps mm. going with it and going mm -hmm. with it. You're like, oh, that's so good. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Ani, we, we're at time and, and, yeah. and just a minute over, but man, it was so good. I mean, you know, that this is my this might be the shortest conversation we've had. It is because you're on the phone for like three hours, right? Or something like that. Yeah. I enjoyed this. And it's always good to be with somebody who knows you. Yeah, you yeah, know? definitely. And knows you know, knows how far you've come. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. <laughs>
Amen. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And I love you very much. Love you too. I love you too. Thank you both. It was amazing. <laughs> if y'all don't have this book yet, buy it and buy a copy for everybody you love. Yeah. Buy it on hardback. I got it on Kindle. I got it on Audible. <laughs> do do all of it. If you get it on Kindle and Audible, you can actually read it and listen to the the voice actors uh, oh, the reading voice it. actors are so good they're aren't so they? good like so you it's can like do a movie it. in your mind yeah so you can mm -hmm. do you can actually read it and have the voice actors reading it and the whole thing so do do all that do it all yep <laughs> thank you both so much thank you so much thank you melanie so thank you all for joining us and uh we'll see you again soon